Hi, my name is Jeremy Hickey from Siemens Digital Industry Software, and welcome to the vendor session today. Uh, the last vendor session, I'm, I'm bringing up the caboose here, so hopefully we'll end well um, for everyone who's been attending different parts of the conference throughout. So I'm gonna um, turn the video off here, but just wanted to make sure that everybody saw there's you know, a person here on the other end, um, since we're all visiting uh, these conferences, you know, are, are always interesting um, virtually, but you know, it, it can be a little bit um, as a dispersonal uh, thing. So I wanted to make sure everyone could see that. I'm gonna stop the video and uh, share my screen instead here. So uh, as I said, right, welcome. And thanks um, thanks for sticking around um, for everyone who's joining us. Um, this is the last of the vendor sessions at the, at the um, Thermal Fluids Workshop uh, 2022 here. And I will go over some advancements in the hypersonic CFD simulations uh, in SimCenter Star CCM Plus, um, some of the recent features that really work towards um, being able to simulate those hypersonic CFD applications in SimCenter Star CCM Plus. Again, um, my name is Jeremy Hinke. I'm a solutions consultant in the SimCenter 3D Fluid Center of Excellence here in the Americas zone for Siemens Digital Industries software. I'll go over a quick uh, agenda of what we're gonna do. And so first I'll kind of lay a, a bit of a groundwork. Everyone probably knows, but I wanted to kind of at least put a, a overview of the groundwork of what hypersonic applications really kind of lend themselves to CFD, where the main challenges for simulation are for that. And then talk about the features in SimCenter Star CCM Plus that allow us to model this complex uh, situation, the complex simulation that we need. Uh, there's kind of three uh, classifications or three tiers I'm gonna go over is first of all, geometry and meshing and then looking at the physical models that are required, and then the solver and, and those tricks. And then we're gonna end with a bit of a demonstration. So I'll have a short demonstration where I show these tricks um, in SimCenter Star CCM Plus. All right, so let's start by kind of talking through the, uh, the overview of what these applications are and where, where we see this need for CFD for this, right? So of course, right, the first two are related to getting access to space, both talking about getting there and getting back. So first we're talking about launch vehicles. I was hoping that this would be a really topical, you know, I could I could replace my uh, digital render image of the Artemis one lifting off with a uh, image from the launch. Um, unfortunately, that didn't happen as we all know, um, but, but we're hoping that that will come on. That was, um, uh, I didn't go through a kind of a bio of my history, but, um, 10 years ago, I actually worked at NASA Langley Research Center. One of the last things I did was when we were switching over to SLS, some of the very first kind of simulations and aerodynamics uh, wind tunnel tests that we did there. I was really hoping to see it fly off, but hopefully uh, we'll, we'll resolve the issues and get that done. But of course, right, um, in preparation for this, there's a lot of simulation, a lot of CFD done um, to make sure that these uh, external aerodynamics cases for, for the launch vehicles are done, um, both commercial and government, right? And, and we need to get hypersonic simulations as you get towards the end of the, the launch window at the trajectory. Uh, in some cases, you get up into the, the mildly hypersonic um, range with these launch vehicles. Okay, the, the kind of classic one that I think most people think about when you see or you hear about hypersonic simulations is planetary entry, right? So this is then getting back from space. And these are typically vehicles where we're entering the atmosphere at speeds you know, greater than Mach 20, depending on the mission profile. And we really need, in this case, CFD is a real core, um, a core requirement of the design because it's a really hard regime to sim to test, uh, and and we really need simulation to fill the gaps and, and help us during our design to ensure that we have accurate aerothermal loads and aerothermal environments for the vehicle. Right. This is an example from both the you know the uh, Mars Curiosity ro rover. Um, you can see from the seven minutes of terror. Um, video that they were talking about all of the loads as you come down through a planetary entry. Uh, and then again, another artist rendering of the, the Orion um, back when uh, it was called EFT-1. I think I should update that. Uh, it's now part of the Artemis 1 mission. Again, was hoping to replace this with, uh, with some video of the actual, but uh, we'll have to deal with the artist renderings for now. Of course, right, these, this is really a regime where CFD is used very heavily, right? And we'll talk about this. The demo I have is actually um, a, a demo of the Apollo capsule um, geometry. So. And then finally, there's there's a kind of a, a newer but but very um, very topical and in the news one is air breathing hypersonics, especially when you talk about uh, systems for defense uh, applications, right? So here we have a couple of artist conceptual drawings for um, from the major U.S. defense contractors, 
And really investment in this area in the research and development has really increased and will continue to increase in recent years. Um, unlike in your launch and reentry vehicles, an air breathing hypersonic system is going to operate at that speed for a, a much longer part of the flight envelope. It kind of is the whole of the flight envelope um, that you're doing. And there's some unique challenges for these simulations where you're talking about design of the inlets, shock isolators, um, supersonic combustion, morphing structures. There's a lot of different um, specific challenges in, in the air breathing hypersonics that really need an immense amount of, of simulation, right? Because again, this is a really hard thing to test. Uh, it's very expensive, very difficult to get the test conditions. Uh, and, and really, um, this is where computational fluid dynamics is going to have to provide the bulk of the design data for these air breathing hypersonic systems. Okay, so what what's kind of the common thread in here? And I've, I've said it a number of times, right? Um, I might reword this to say the common digital thread for these applications, right? All of these things really require simulation and computational simulation, computational fluid dynamic simulation as a critical part of the design path, right? This is not a regime where we can rely on flight tests or, or wind tunnel tests as our only, uh, our only option. There's a really big part of this that requires hypersonic aerothermodynamic environments to be characterized through simulation. Right. Um, so, right. This is also going to lead to a lot of regular regulatory review, um, review requirements, and re reliable digital models that we need to have uh, confidence in, and and a lot of um, a lot of accuracy and and confidence for the validation of these. All right. So, what are the specific challenges that that go into that when you're talking about? Okay, now we need to simulate these environments. What what is uh, the difficulty of that? Right, what things make it difficult? Well, I'll go back to a quote from uh, Werner von Braun back in the the 50s, right, where we know we can lick gravity, we can do all these things, but sometimes the paperwork, or in this case, the simulation work, is overwhelming. There's a lot of details that that make these applications hard to simulate. Right. So first off, right, if we kind of break simulation into or CFD simulation in a number of regimes, I'm not going to talk about the lower speed ones in supersonic and transonic all the way uh, down to subsonic. Those have their own challenges, right? There's a lot of turbulent flow, turbulence modeling um, kind of questions and things that are, are active research areas. But when you talk about the hypersonics regime, right, these flows have their own sets of challenges. So Oftentimes, unlike uh, in the lower speed flows where a lot of the research involves turbulence modeling and how to properly simulate turbulence regimes for these, a lot of times these hypersonic flows are laminar or transitional where they're really not, um, turbulence is less of an, uh, a challenge or less of a modeling challenge, right? There's other modeling uncertainties that are, are more prevalent and more uh, important in these cases. Not saying that they aren't uh, also needing to look at turbulence, but it's, it's sometimes less of a, um, a focus. But what is really focused is obviously compressibility effects, shocks, and equation of state problems dominate these flows, right? You can't use ideal gas assumptions anymore once you get up into a hypersonic regime where we have very complex physics going on, sometimes dissociation and all of that, right? So let's look at that. We'll kind of break it out into a, a little bit more of a detailed look at what real gas effects are, right? So as you move up in Mach number to the right on this graph from, from Glenn Research Center, uh, the stagnation temperature of, of an object is going to go up sort of along this curve, right? And as we get into the hypersonic re regime, we start activating vibrational modes in the air. Um, dissociation and plasma ionization can occur at the very high Mach numbers when you start talking about reentry. Um, and all of these things require an accurate uh, equation of state. You can't really use uh, your real, you can't really use ideal gas laws anymore. And oftentimes you may need to, to go to things like polynomials or um, other curve fits from data looking at kind of really modeling what the gas behaves. And at the higher levels, you do need to actually account for the things like dissociation and thermal non-equilibrium. The other kind of big um, canonical thing that's been seen in, in CFD simulations of hypersonic flows is something called carbuncle. It's a numerical instability that's related to um, how, how a grid, especially for an unstructured grid, how the effects of the grid itself and the discretization uh, lead to a numerical artifact. It's kind of like a tumor or a, uh, what's a, a carbuncle, which is why it's called a carbuncle, but a, a tumor, a little kind of bubble. And this is an example of a simulation that's exhibiting that, where you see this kind of blister uh, in the bow shock, right, uh, on the hypersonic uh, HL20 body here at Mach 20, or Mach 10, I should say. 
Um, and this has been an especially prevalent problem for unstructured grids, right? So, you know, structured grids can kind of be aligned with the shock flow. They have less of a problem with this um, carbuncle phenomenon. And so it's really been a challenge in the numerics um, world to look at how, we, how can we mitigate carbuncle for unstructured grids so that we can use those unstructured grids that have really uh, high advantages for um, meshing time and, and being able to deal with complex geometries in a much more efficient fashion. Okay, so those are kind of some of the challenges involved with simulating uh, hypersonics. So we're going to look at how Star CCM Plus, SimCenter Star CCM Plus, is, is looking to meet these challenges so that people can get reliable simulations for these regimes. So I'll start with talking about the geometry, um, geometric fidelity, and meshing. Right. So when you talk about that, you really need um, some of these cases are fairly simple geometries. You get capsules and things like that. But even with those, there's geometric details that we really need to model with accuracy in order to model the complex system. And, and that's only gonna become more and more important as these systems get more prevalent and more complicated, right? And, and what we really need is a simulation platform that allows us to capture all the necessary details, right? If we have you know geometric details that we have to capture, we really should simulate those because as we found out from a number of cases, right? If we simplify things too far, we can actually get rid of behavior that's really the critical behaviors that, that can lead to failures and lead to, to problems in the system, right? We want to make sure we can capture the actual detail in the system so that we get an accurate, um, an accurate and high fidelity model that we're going to make our decisions off of, right? In order to do that, we have to robustly mess these, mesh these complex geometries, right? If, if we want an accurate digital twin to the physical model, we need to be able to reliably, um, robustly mesh these complex systems. And then one of the, the challenges that I didn't really mention, but is, is very prevalent in hypersonics, is we, we wanna usually have to adapt the mesh. These shock structures that happen, as you can see in the HL20 model here, you can see kind of an outline of a shock structure that's been adapted, uh, the mesh has been adapted to it. Uh, these off-body structures change, change with angle of attack, change with Mach number, and it's really um, advantageous to be able to adapt the mesh to those in order to capture them um, at the same level of fidelity, no matter what the conditions that you're running are. Okay, so again, SimCenter Star CCM Plus excels with uh, a lot of this um, geometry modeling and meshing and robust meshing are, are one of the strengths of the, of the platform. And so you can see some examples of some um, missile cases here and some details on protuberances and very other, various other complex geometries. And Star CCM Plus's automated polyhedral, hexahedral, unstructured meshes work really well for these cases. We have a lot of control over the boundary layer. Uh, and boundary layer mesher options that you have in order to really reliably mesh uh, an unstructured mesh for these cases in a very short amount of time, and then be able to repeat that as you make design changes. There's also availability to make structured meshes. I'm using a directed mesher. Um, that's what's used on, this is a, a canonical biconic case that's gonna be shown a little bit later when we talk about the physics models. Um, but that's available so that you can make high quality structured meshes on, on simpler type of geometries, usually not used for the full up 3D geometries, but for 2D cases and validations, it can be really advantageous to make those meshes with the direct meshing. And then the other big kind of meshing thing is meshing can take a lot of time for these complex cases, right? And so the meshers in Simpson R Star CCM Plus have been paralyzed, so you can execute them in parallel on your HPC systems to really drive down the turnaround time. As I mentioned, right, you need to not only be able to build the original mesh, but have efficient mesh adaptation um, to mesh to flow field and other features for complex motions. So you can see some examples of that here. On the, the top, we have a, a simulation of a rocket booster separation that can happen at the low hypersonic or, or um, subsonic regimes where we actually are adapting the mesh to where these boosters and shocks are, are moving throughout the separation event. Um, you can see that the, the Mach number is clearly shown here and then the next um, part of the image is going to show the mesh that's actually adapting as these shocks move and as the, the boosters move. You can see that um, we have adapting mesh as that transient happens. There's also model-driven um, uh, adaptive mesh refinement for the overset meshing. So right when you have an overset mesh like this and you have bodies moving uh, for separation events and those type of things, it'll automatically adapt the mesh to make sure that we get a good interpolation between those overset meshes. And then finally, the, the shock refinement is done through a user-defined adaptive mesh or, or AMR, where we can take uh, shocks, vor vortices, wakes, other features, and, and adapt. So you can see here there's a sweep of uh, angles of attack, and the same mesh that starts out with is able to adapt to all those different conditions uh, to ensure that you get a, a efficient 
an accurate mesh for all those cases. All right, so how does that work kind of in practice? I'm going to show the HL20 model in a little bit more detail here. When we look at we have a baseline mesh, and we've identified a shock um, structure. We solve an initial solution, right, which is very coarse, as you can see. And now we're going to activate that adaptive mesh refinement. You can see how quickly that shock refinement really drives down to what the final solution is. It converges to a very quick um, final uh, adaptive mesh solution that really gives a good resolution of that bow shock. Okay, we'll zoom in, we can see, or zooming out, I should say, right? You can see that the pressure gradients um, throughout the wake are refined, so we didn't have to do any uh, a priori refinement here. This really helps, number one, in efficiency and also uh, in reducing mesh count, right? So we don't have to uh, refine everywhere, we can only refine where we really need it. Okay, and you can see as we zoom back in, right, if you look at the, the numerical schlearing here, you get a very sharp, well-defined shock structure. Okay, I'm going to skip ahead here, right, and look uh, at the second tier of this. Uh, we'll come back and look at some of the meshing um, in the demo at the end. But, of course, as we mentioned, right, we need to have accurate physical models that, that are able to, to adequately model the complexity of the situation in these cases. So we want to make sure we have a solver that's applicable. So um, SimCenter Star System Plus has solvers applicable all the way through hypersonic flow regimes. Um, we can solve laminar, transitional, and turbulent flows uh, on any scale. So we have a, a lot of different models there, uh, both from a laminar, an inviscid, transitional, all the way up to turbulent and, and DES and LES cases. Um, not, as I said, needed as much for the, the hypersonic regime, but as you get into the, the lower Mach numbers into the subsonic regime, those become very important. Uh, there's a, a really good ability to model radiation and conjugate heat transfer, so we can model the thermal environment as needed. Right? as well as a number of models that are specific to hypersonic cases. Right, So we got uh, mentioned as real gas modeling. We have an equilibrium air model in SimCenter Star CCM Plus that is using curve fits from the data available um, in canonical data for those cases that really efficiently models for things like uh, dissociation and the internal energy excitation without having to actually resolve those reactions. Right, So there are times when we want to, for ablation purposes or whatever, actually physically model the reactions, and we can do that. Um, there's an extensive reacting flow model framework uh, in order to do that dissociation or combustion. But a lot of cases, if we're just doing an external aerosim, we really don't want to model the, the species transport and all of those details. We can just model it using the equilibrium air equation of state, which will give us a good, uh, a good curve fit model, make sure that we have valid, uh, valid um, air properties throughout the whole regime. I'm not going to touch on much here, but we do have, as well, transition models. This is a transition model shown in a transonic case here uh, in order to transition as needed. Okay. Oh, me. Skip through the video. So looking at um, right some validation cases to prove that out, right? So again, I showed this, this Mach 11 um, blunt biconic case from a, a very canonical, um, very well-known paper um, by Holden. Um, looking at various shock boundary layer interactions, right? And we can see on the right, we have the pressure coefficient comparison versus the um, the axial position. And you can see the star system plus predictions do a very good job of predicting the flow structure on the, and, and the shock structure impinging on, on the body here. Uh, and so this just proves that, you know, we can, we can simulate these cases and, and the sh complex shock boundary layer interaction cases with high degrees of accuracy. As we get up into the, the other um, higher Mach numbers, we often have these dissociation and uh, temperature non-equilibrium effects. Mm -hmm. So here I have two examples showing um, a Mach 16 cylinder on the left, where we actually have a thermal non-equilibrium gas, where we have this impinging shock on a kind of a, a um, cylinder. Uh, and you're looking at the heat flux predictions, right? So the, the blue here, you can't really read the, the key, but the blue here is the test data, right? And the, the red and green are two different um, simulations in SimCenter Star CCM Plus with some different um, a little bit different physics models, but both of them you can see accurately predict the heat flux both in magnitude and, and location pretty well. On the right, you can see um, a case where we're using a full uh, reacting flow simulation uh, at Mach 12, where we're actually taking the dissociation. So we have Mach number here in this, this top picture, and then we have the mass fraction of the um, O molecules, the, the dissociated O molecules. Um, so you can see the amount of dissociation, especially as you get um, close to the, the, the sphere here. So depending on the level of complexity and what, what the particular goals of that simulation are, 
SimCenter Star CCM Plus has a range of all these validated models that are able to be brought to bear to ensure that you can you can accurately simulate the sim the uh, physics that you want and are important for the particular the particular flow regime. Okay, I'm going to talk a little bit about the solver and then we'll get into the demonstration and then we can have some questions at the end. Um, so the other part that's really necessary and can be a, a real trick um, in these cases, we have models that we know are accurate, we have a good mesh, we have all these things, but um, actually being able to run it in a robust and automated way can oftentimes be the, the thing that makes it very difficult in these hypersonic cases. The solver in SimCenter Star CCM Plus, the coupled solver, has been designed with a number of features that really deliver kind of fast, robust convergence without a whole lot of messing around. You don't have to necessarily know all the details of some things. Um, it handles a lot of the things like CFL control and other things in order to deliver a kind of a robust convergence for a wide variety of cases. Additionally, there's an awesome plus flux vector scheme that's been modified specifically to mitigate carbuncle effects. Um, that was put, brought in about a year ago at SimCenter Star CCM Plus and shows a really uh, important effect on mitigating that carbuncle for these unstructured meshes that are really the core of SimCenter Star CCM Plus. And then, of course, you know the other part that you really need is we need to have the ability to parallelize this, right? Our, our HPC and hardware abilities are, are going exponentially faster than, uh, than we we can keep up with. We want to make sure that we can have a parallel solver that will really maximize the throughput and enable us to use those uh, those high performance computing resources efficiently. Okay, so again, right, a little bit more detail on some of those. There's the, the automatic control of the solver CFL. I'll show you how that works, and that that can automatically ramp up and down, um, basically the speed that the solver is trying to run in order to maintain a robust simulation um, for an out of the box flow regime. Uh, as I said, we, we enhance the Awesome Plus Flux scheme to reduce carbuncle. There's advanced initialization procedures that allow us to get better condition, initial conditions without having to um, really set up a manual function to do that. And then here you can see an example. This is a, a subsonic case, or a, a, sorry, a transonic case, um, but you can see the solver um, scalability here. Linear is the dotted line, uh, and you can see that we have, um, on a number of different cores, we, we scale very well up to tens of thousands of cores. All right, so with that, I'm going to pop out of the PowerPoint here, and we'll go back and look at some of these things in action. Okay, so we have about five minutes. I'm going to try and finish at 11.30 like, like was uh, stated, and then we have lots of time to go back and ask some more questions as needed. So this is, again, that Apollo capsule that you've seen in, uh, in some of the cases. What I'm showing here is a volume render, um, which is built into SimCenter Star CCM Plus. We have uh, a built-in engine to do all of the post-processing, pre-processing, so you're in one environment from, from start to finish. We're showing the temperature field uh, kind of in the volume, which is, and the temperature field on the heat on the heat sink itself. Right? And so you can see the, the very hot gases right behind the bow shock, as you'd expect. Uh, and then that kind of spills over the edge of the lip and you have um, some hot, hot wake as well. Okay, so I want to uh, highlight some of the things that I mentioned and show how they're implemented here in Star System Plus. So again, our physics models are set up so that we have um, efficient meshing, right? We have the coupled flow solver and we're using an efficient, a high accuracy muscle third order central differencing scheme. We're using that equilibrium air model, which allows us to then take those equilibrium air curve fit datas, right? And assign all of the air properties, so speed of sound, thermal conductivity, specific heat, dynamic viscosity, all of these are assigned using those equilibrium air properties, ensuring that we get a valid representation of the air um, even though we're up at an area where we would expect some of those vibrational excitation modes and things like that. All of that's set up um, just within the physics models, right? And we can say easily we can set up um, our, our free stream domains. So one thing here we set altitude and Mach number. Um, you can see that I have a Mach ramp here. This is a very common way, um, even, at, uh, even with an efficient solver, right? Starting up at Mach 20 is, is a bit of a challenge here. So I want to show it's very easy to set up a, a little quick ramp. Um, to ramp Mach number up, and that's what we did in this simulation. All right, so if I go down here to the function, I'm not going to worry about the syntax of that, but essentially what you can see in the bottom here, right, this is a preview of it. You can see that uh, we start at Mach 5 for a little bit, for over 500 iterations, and then ramp the Mach number up to Mach 20 uh, over the next 500 iterations so that we get uh, a more robust, reliable solution, right? This is just to keep us from, um, from having to kind of slow things down so much, um, we can solve faster by actually initializing the flow at a lower Mach number. So we can see how that looks if we look at the CFL control. Um, and I'm going to switch to that so that you can look at that 
Um, this has two things, right? We have in, in orange the, the showing of the heat shield temperature. So that's an indication of, of the convergence, really. It takes a very long time for the um, for the temperature field to converge in these hypersonic cases because of the way that the flow has to relax. But in the green or teal, you can see with the actual CFL number or the, the current number that's being used as kind of the speed of the, the solver um, as it's solving the steady state case. And you can see at the beginning, when we're at a lower Mach number, we have a higher CFL number. And then the automatic CFL control in Star System Plus automatically ramps that down as that Mach number is increasing so that we maintain a robust solution. And we have, have an appropriate, efficient solve, but we, we maintain a robust solution automatically. So this was not set up with anything beyond just saying, hey, use the automatic CFL control, right? And basically use the default values here. Um, and this basically allows this to, to go off on its own and, and adjust for, for how the solver needs to, to behave based on the, the convergence of the sim. Okay, um, I don't necessarily want to show too much else. We're using the expert, the grid sequencing initialization again to start um, start things off with a good initial solution. Um, and, and that's used throughout. We can see that this goes here. I want to show some of the solution and, and how this looks and how, how it was set up to give some tips and tricks for people that might want to look at uh, the best practices to simulate these in Simpson or Service Season Plus. So if we look at Mach number here, right, you can see the, the bow shock as, as you'd expect, a little bit of a wake. Um, I'm going to zoom in so you can see what the grid looks like a bit. This is a pretty coarse grid. It's about a million um, cells. I think it's uh, 1.2 million cells. So it's a pretty coarse grid. Um, but one thing that's key about this is that we, we've used our, um, our boundary layer meshing to extend our, our quote unquote boundary layer or body fitted cells much further out than you normally see. A lot of times these are really kind of just to capture the boundary layer, which is obviously much thinner than, than what these, uh, these layers are shown here. But this, this um, method actually allows us to get a much better solution. Even in an unstructured grid, right, we can extend our, our body fitted layers out beyond where the bow shock is going to be. And you can see that that really aligns that mesh very, very closely with the bow shock, right? It's, of course, going to be sitting just off of the, um, the heat shield here. Um, but having an aligned mesh really gives us a, a much more kind of well-refined solution. And I can show that by, I, I actually have, uh, another case that I ran with basically the same meshing algorithm, but just you know thinner layers. And I'm going to pull up a comparison so you can say, take a look at how that changes. All right, so if I expand this a little bit. On the top, you can see the mesh that I was showing you, right, with the, the extended boundary layers, right? On the left is Mach number. On the right is the heat shield temperature. And you see a nice even, even heat shield um, with no carbuncle effects on that. When you go into an unstructured mesh, even with whatever carbuncle medications you have, right, it, it's not so much carbuncle that happens, right? You don't see any blisters here, right? But you do see a very diffused, right, kind of um, spread out shock because the mesh is just not well suited for capturing that shock, right? Without ad adaptation, right, this is this is not a great, um, a well aligned shock mesh for the case of the physics, right? So extending that out will give us a really nice very clean solution without any need for adaptation at all. Now, we can actually go to the point of getting adaptation involved, right? And I have an example of that here. So again, here's the mesh, right? It's a, a 1 million cell mesh, right? But if I go ahead and change, change the um, representation here, I made a run where I then took that um, adaptive mesh refinement algorithm, right, and allowed it to um, refined based on the shocks that are expected here. And you can see that, right, you get a very nice adaptation through that bow shock, and you get some uh, in the wake as well. This mesh ended up being about 6 million cells, which is, you know, more, but not, not very large. But you get a, a much, much tighter um, capturing of the shock, which, of course, will give you better accuracy and, and a better um, a better representation here. So I'll show you what that looks like on the, on the Mach number field here as well. All right, so I can switch the Mach number on this case to show the same solution with our adaptive mesh refinement. Right, you can see that now we have a, a much, much more refined shock throughout. Right, it's a very tightly, very well resolved bow shock. And this will give us the highest accuracy that we can. And then any, any angle of attack that we run, this will adapt to what that angle of attack would be. It allows us to very robustly run a whole range of conditions without having to really refine the mesh everywhere and spend a lot of cells. So it's a much more efficient way to do it. 
And finally, I just wanted to show that we can uh, also, this is solving temperature, we could, we could include um, effects of um, this, the conjugate heat transfer on the heat shield if we wanted to. And you can see that, you know, we get a very nice, clean, um, non-carbuncled um, wall shear stress, which means basically that we don't have kind of those big uh, numeric errors and numeric junctions that you normally see with an unstructured mesh because of all of the things that we've shown so far. So with that, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wrap it up here. I'm at uh, around the, the top of the hour, or the bottom of the hour, I should say. Um, and just note that um, SimCenter Star System Plus is part of the SimCenter portfolio, right? It's part of our commitment at Siemens to ensure that you can have a comprehensive digital twin that's really going to be the, um, the driving engine to engineer in innovation for these hypersonic cases, right? All of these applications are going to require really accurate, robust simulation. And we at Siemens really want to help provide the tools that allow engineers to, to drive that innovation in this, in this kind of space revolution that's happening right now. There's a lot of excitement around it. It's fun. Uh, it's a really fun time to be working in space and hypersonics, I think. Uh, and we want to help make sure that you guys can do that, do your jobs in the ways that uh, allow us to engineer tomorrow's reality today. All right. Thank you very much. I will um, close this part, and we can ask uh, if there's any questions in the chat. Uh, the first one I see is from um, from Eric um, about why is hypersonic flow less fully turbulent? So turbulence versus you know whether something's laminar or turbulent really depends on the Reynolds number, right? And so you know a lot of these hypersonic flows, you're right, right? They're uh, for, for sure up the high altitudes. They're definitely laminar because the Reynolds number is so low at these cases. It has to do with density, right? Remember Reynolds number is you know rho times v times the, length scale over the dynamic viscosity, right? And at the kind of altitudes that you're usually running these hypersonic cases, especially for re-entry, right? The, the density is so low that the Reynolds number is very low. You don't really have turbulent effects. Essentially, you're going so fast that you don't have time for it to be turbulent, uh, essentially is what it comes down to. Now, of course, turbulence is important in some of these flows, right? Especially as you start talking about the hypersonic air breathing engines that are maybe gonna operate at a little bit lower altitude or, or need to operate in a, in a larger kind of flow regime at a hypersonic speed. Um, turbulence certainly can be important. However, it's just not as much of a driver of kind of the simulation uncertainties as they are at the lower effects where we know, right, we know that turbulence and turbulence modeling uh, is, is really the key un, unanswered questions, right? In hypersonic flow, a lot of them actually are laminar or at least transitional in, in, in nature. OK, um, hopefully that answered that question, Eric. It's, I don't know if you're moderating these or if they're all coming um, just from the oh, panel. Yeah, yeah, I'm listening. So, so I, I, I okay. think what you're saying is it, it primarily because of the altitude for most of these hypersonic flows you're analyzing. Yeah, it's primarily Reynolds number driven, right? right so right, right, yeah. But during, I would think like if you were modeling hypersonic reentry, that would be dominated by turbulent. I'll pop this back in because it's not not behaving well. Yep. Yeah, it, it certainly does come into play, right? And so it, right, right. it it depends on the case, right? I would certainly recommend anybody who's doing hypersonic simulations, right? Um, do a, a calculation of the Reynolds number um, and you know look at you know kind of your your canonical kind of lookup tables of Reynolds number versus um, versus your drag for for various things, right? right you can kind of right. see whether you're in a laminar regime or not. Yeah. Um, you do see a lot of cases too where um, you can see it in like the experimental or flight data, right? You can see that you have a big jump in the heating or something when you get, you know, a certain axial distance back. And that's indication of transition. Now that that's a whole, um, that's a very active, very, um, I would say, unanswered question in, in the simulation world about transitional modeling at hypersonics, right? It's very important because in a lot of these cases, right, that where, where the flow transitions from laminar to turbulent, you're going to get a big spike in a lot of quantities, right? Especially heating. And so that's really critical to know, but it's also very, very difficult, right? Um, right. The transition models in SimCenter Star System Plus are valid all the way up through hypersonic. But, you know, as most people that, that study transition modeling and transition um, models themselves, right? Most of the data is really at like a transonic speed, right? They're really developed around kind of uh, wings and, and airfoils at transonic speed. 
Um, so we have some customers that are actively using some Center Star CCM Plus to go after transitional flows up at Hypersonics and have had success doing that. But it's a very much an active and, and kind of proprietary area of research. So a lot of those customers, right, are, are working on kind of tuning the models for their specific data that they have. Um, and it's it's definitely something that yeah. is an active research area. Yeah. So most of the hypersonic stuff I under, I realize is at high altitude, like the air breathing stuff. There's a lot going mm -hmm. on for defense. So that that that's more related just to the altitude. It's not a general statement across hypersonics for all altitudes. Is right. Thinking. Yep. Okay. I'll go on to the next question here. Right. Um, the next question was, for a multi-booster launch vehicle such as SLS or Artemis 1, does the tool calculate the shock interaction heating that occurs when the shock from one booster impinges on another structure? Uh, yes, it does. So we're, we're computing, right, the full, in the case that you saw, right, the, the I'll, I'll scroll back to where, where that uh, example is, right? So you've got this case right here, right? And you're running this kind of, this is a, a notional one, it's not obviously Artemis. Um, but this simulation, we're only simulating the air side of things, right? So you get the full shock boundary layer interactions and all of the heating that would have um, come into play from that, right? So you would get the shock interaction heating on the surface from this. Now, this particular simulation is not a conjugate heat transfer simulation where we're also simulating the solid and, and the temperature in the solid and how that actually affects things. But you can get the external effects directly from this, right? So you'll see, as you see, this this is showing just the shock structure. But if you showed the temperature field, you would see that temperature field, and you'd see that moving shock impingement heating that would come from that. So yeah, it, it's all uh, if you have that all in um, right in, in these sims up at hypersonics, you can't simulate it without simulating the temperature effects. You have to simulate it all coupled together. That's what the coupled solver actually. The name is from coupling. Uh, the mass momentum and energy equations all together and solving them all together because you have to at this regime, right? The, the effects of temperature are so important on the properties of the gas that you have to solve everything together in order to get an accurate sim. So yes, you do get out of this kind of case, you get the shock interaction um, heating directly out of this. Any other questions? Or any other, is, does that answer that question? For, um, oh yeah, 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 that's yeah, very powerful okay. tool, thanks. Um, there's another question that was, please describe ascent and reentry anchoring that has been done for the arrow heating prediction feature of this code. That one, I'm not sure if I understand um, exactly what's being asked. So do you know where that's from, Eric? Can you yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Have state you, that have a little you, bit? Have uh, you know, uh, done any analysis where you predicted, like say, for example, ascent arrow heating or hypersonic arrow heating and then have measurements, say, with calorimeters that you that you can compare. Yeah, there there is some validation data there. So that's um, one of the cases. There's, there we go. Right, like a case like this, right? This is this. There's a heating aspect of this one as well, right? And so you can predict the CH, the heating co um, coefficient as well. And we predict that it, basically with this, if you predict the the shock structure correctly, right, using the the proper kind of um, real gas models, you also predict the heating very well, right? So we we have that as well. Um, one of the problems with, uh, I find, at least with kind of sharing things that are, are um, in the hypersonic regime, so much of it is so proprietary, right? It's very hard to get customer data that's validation data on flight vehicles because so much of this uh, is, you know, it's defense related or it's very proprietary stuff. Um, so there are cases that customers have looked at validation data um, on flight tests and things like that. Um, but most of what we can share are these kind of canonical cases like this. So there's this one's pressure coefficient, but we also have the the, um, the heating, the Stanton number coefficient um, comparison here that that's also very good. So um, some of these, right, when you start getting into things like ablation and, and ionization, those ones are a little bit harder to deal with because it's harder to get good data on those, right? So some of these cases are canonical cases that there's some canonical test data from wind tunnels. Um, and again, right, this is about as about what you can get most of the time for these cases. Um, I think the next question said is what data is output that can be used in a thermal and uh, thermal analysis? So is adiabatic wall temp or HTC? Um, so that that depends on what you want to get out of it. You could get both um, 80, you could run an adiabatic wall temp 
Uh, if you if you set the walls as adiabatic, right, you'll basically get an adiabatic wall temp directly out of that. Um, if you the other route of doing it, so most and I'll I'll switch to my simulation file here, right. So uh, this particular case, the walls are simulated as adiabatic. Right? So if I go to my my heat shield wall, right, I am thermal specification is adiabatic. So what you get out of this, right, we're assuming an adiabatic wall. You're going to get an adiabatic wall temperature out of this. So if I whoops pull up the one I want, the heat shield temperature. This is essentially the the predicted adiabatic wall temp. So that can be used directly, and, and a lot of people like doing that. The other way to simulate this, and it can be done very easily in Star System Plus, people will assume a wall temperature, right? Usually, usually um, the way it's done is simulating just a temperature and have a fixed wall temperature that can vary over the, the field, right? You could, you could set it up to be any kind of um, function that you want, um, but you'll have a fixed wall temperature Right, and then you then you're computing a heat transfer coefficient, right? You basically have a, a heat transfer coefficient at a reference temperature, right? And and you could output that directly. So instead of having temperature here, I could rerun the sim with a temperature set, and then I could I could export the heat transfer coefficient. So either one's possible. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Does that answer that question? Yeah, it does. That's a great feature because a lot of times. Been in situations where you have two different engineers, one doing what Star CCM does, or I'm not, I mean, I've seen what this code does. I was just looking at the next question coming up. Mm -hmm. What this code does, and then you have another engineer doing thermal analysis, and that that's yep. kind of always something that comes up. With, uh, yeah, it usually gets check. coupled. You know, those things kind of most of the time they're some they're kind of decoupled, right? One one just feeds to the other, and they're not necessarily being solved. In an iterative fashion together, right? Right, right. Um, exactly. I think that gets into. I'll skip ahead. There's another one about does a code perform thermal response analysis of the body? It kind of is the yeah. same. Yeah, same question, thing. Right? Yeah, that was. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and I didn't show any on this one. Most of those sims, most of the time, people run these separately, right? But there is the capability of running a co-simulation either with an external um, thermal analysis code or directly within SimCenter Star CCM Plus. So you can run a conjugate heat transfer simulation where you're actually modeling the body if you have the, the um you know the the thicknesses and the, the material properties right you set those up you can directly model that either as a finite volume or a finite element thermal model um, and we can simulate that all in one where you'd have a coupled response then right um that certainly within the capabilities of the code in fact it's very good at doing conjugate heat transfer coefficient conjugate heat transfer simulations um, and so there's a couple of frameworks to do that, either coupling with an external thermal code or just doing it um, in an all-in-one uh, um, framework within SimSonar Star System Plus. Either one can be done. I, I frankly haven't seen as many customers doing that. It's still kind of the way that everyone's done things, right? So people have, they've always been separate groups, right? You have a group that does the CFD and a group that does the thermal. And right, they, they share data with each other, but right, they're not, under the same kind of organizational structure a lot of times. And so I haven't seen that much of that kind of um, co-simulation, but I really think that moving forward, that's gonna be a key thing to kind of move forward our capabilities and get better predictions of this, is to actually bring that simulation world together, right? It's really one simulation and it's it doesn't make much sense to have the things be decoupled, right? Um, it it right. makes sense to have them together, and we have the ability to do that with with the SimCenter portfolio, especially in the hypersonics where you where you have lots going on, like such as dis disassociation and so on. Yeah, the high yeah, and so that gets in. You know, you, I don't want to get way way off the off the kind of thread here, but when you start getting into things like ablation effects. Um, then you get into some very complicated physics. So we can do a lot of it, but a lot of it is kind of, you know, I, I think that there hasn't been a lot of frameworks for how to deal with a lot of the effects, right? So you can you can maybe predict the ablation rate, but when you actually have an ablative surface, right, you're you're making a chemical reaction happen at the ablation surface, and then it's off-gassing, and you have lots of very complex reactions going on there. Um, and I think that, you know, the question of how to simulate that in the most efficient fashions still a bit of an open question right do you need all of those effects or can you kind of simulate ablation using a, a model that will basically just simulate the recession of that ablative surface right without actually modeling the species that are off-gassed and, and then put out into the um you know the charring and all that so 
our SimCenter um, 3D solution, which I haven't touched on here, but it's part of the SimCenter portfolio from Siemens, does have an ablation model that can basically be used to kind of predict the, the recession of the ablative material. And you can couple that together in SimCenter Star CCM Plus, and then just so we can adapt the mesh to the shock structure here, right? We could adapt the surface here to the recession rate and then you know, update the model and, and run that transient simulation of an ablation. Um, Again, it's it's one of those things where I think as we advance the kind of simulation of these things, we're going to have to advance how we do it, and and that's something to certainly look into in the future. Um, it's it's still I bit I think a bit of an open question what the best way to do it is because of the complexity of the simulation, the the situation, right? Whether you need to include those effects of the off gas in the in the flow model, or whether you can just kind of okay, we know the rate of recession based on the temperature, um, and we're going to then simulate that rate of recession and morph the geometry, morph the mesh and update our flow solution uh, to ensure we don't have problems. Right. Well, in, in your work, have do you think that there's any cases where the injection of the mass into the, you know, into the flow would actually affect the, the flow analysis? It, the, the answer I'm sure is yes, right? So in reality, we know that that is going to make an effect right but the question is how much and right. is yeah, it i guess is I it pose my required question. to get a reasonable accuracy right that's always the the big kicker when it comes to simulation right we know that we can simulate all these things so should we right and when you add that much complexity sometimes you're adding so much stuff that your 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 inputs are so uncertain that yes we could model it but like the data we have is so limited that we're kind of just throwing darts at the air, right? About how much off gassing is happening, right? Exactly what the velocity of that off gassing is, right? Um, there's a lot of uncertain inputs, right? And and so I I oftentimes caution let, let's build things up in a sensible, kind of simplest matter simplest model that that meets the objectives of what we're trying to simulate. But I, you know, I think that you're right. I think that you know it probably all does matter. The question is, what are your what are your goals in the simulation? And does it matter to kind of the accuracy of those goals, right? Usually when it comes to design of these things, at least for a lot that I've been involved with, you know, we really just need to know what the peak heating loads are and how that's going to affect the ablation. And once we can kind of simulate that ablation, right? Now we can kind of say, okay, this ablation is now changing the aerodynamics, changing the heating loads, which we can do without having to simulate the off gassing. And how does that kind of affect you know, how we're going to design the TPS system or something. Um, but yeah, it, it's it's definitely a difficult question. Another question, this one's from Pranay, um, about what are the turbulence chemistry coupling models or combustion models available in star Plus? plus um, So there is a very extensive reacting flow framework. Um, I don't have time to get into all of it, um, but there's a number of different ways of setting that up from a complex chemistry model that you can basically define all of your reaction physics, right? So like that, that um, ionization example, um, this one, right? So this, this ionization example, right? We have, I forget, I think it's a nine species model that's going on in this one um, where we have, you know, and, and, you know, you got N2 and O2 splitting into N plus N and O plus O, and then they can uh, react together. You get the, the other products and the cross products and things like that. Um, so that chemistry model is basically uh, allowing, you know, whatever uh, chemistry model that you bring in. There's also things like eddy breakup models, um, flamelet models. Those are more um, well suited for actual combustion. So if we're talking about like a supersonic combustion case in a scramjet, right? Um, some of those might come to play, um, but usually a lot of these cases, you know, the, whether you can whether you can simplify, you know, flamelet models is a simplified kind of chemistry model where instead of um, transporting all the species, right? We just kind of use use basically a pseudo variable that says, okay, how complete is this reaction, right? From zero to one. And then based on that, we table look up all the rest of the things. We build a table lookup and we assume that the, the chemistry is happening faster than the flow speeds. Well, turns out when you start getting up into hypersonic and, and even supersonic combustion cases, that assumption of the combustion or the reactions are happening faster than the flow um, transport properties isn't a very good assumption usually. So usually you have to model those with an explicit reacting species transport model, which is one of the kinds that Star System Plus has. That's what's being used here, where you actually define all of the reactions you want, all the products, all the Arrhenius coefficients and all of that. Uh, and then it will actually transport all these species and, and solve for the transport of them. 
think the last one here, and Heston, I don't know if this is talking about if you if your last comment about this being answered is is regarding this question. Um, but I was talking about the adaptive mesh transient CHT model been run, and is it is that model complex a complex model like that feasible in three or two D cases? Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm sure someone's done it in in some academic setting. I mean, really, really, what I'm highlighting is is these tools have been developed. Some of them have been anchored. All of them have been bundled into SimCenter, which is really cool. I'd, I'd love to get my fingers on some of this stuff. Um, but it, how practical is that to answer a question? You know, like you have a L time. You know, you're three months out, and to get all of those physics that are really happening built into the model and to have it make robust solutions. You could be toying with it for well over a year. It does Sim have from your experience with Sim Center, what's the turnaround? I mean, I know CFD turnaround times are very long. Um, does this kind of make it f feasible to use regularly with, with it all being bundled in? Yes, we do have customers that are, but you know, I think that you're right about like starting from zero, right? It it might be aggressive to do it really quickly, right? So it I'm not gonna, you know, it'd be nice to say it's all fire and forget, right? Because we have all of these advanced models and robust solvers and everything that you can just open it up, you know, hit mesh, tell it to go run. Well, we're not quite to that level yet, right? I think that uh, it's not quite to the point of, hey, I want everything and I want it now. Um, but as far as, you know, a, a pathway to that, one of the things that I really like about working for Siemens um, as a software vendor is right, we're really committed to helping our customers get there, right? We have a dedicated support engineer model where our customers get a, a dedicated engineer to them that knows their problems and, and knows what their goals are and will help them kind of achieve those goals as they go along. And so we have customers that have built in very, very complex models um, all the way up to that, whether, you know, some of those, um, you know, CHT models in an adaptive mesh transient case I think people have run it. I don't know that many people have found that to be necessary. Um, right. Most yeah, of the yeah. time, right, adaptive mesh transient cases don't involve the CHT, um, but that doesn't mean, certainly doesn't mean it can't, right? That that complexity doesn't add that much, right? It's mm -hmm. it's really the adaptive mesh and the transients that that are really the challenging ones there, right? And it depends on the scenario, but but those can be adapt th those can be set up robustly, although you know. Adaptive mesh is one of those things where it does take a little bit of tuning, right? To figure out what you want to adapt to, right? When you're we're talking about a user-defined case, it's it's very hard to define a very invariant shock adaption uh, criteria. And that's why we don't have a model-based one right now. Um, you'll see some literature and some things out there where people are striving to get towards it, but it's, it's very difficult to make a mock invariant shock capturing scheme, right? If you want one that captures shocks at Mach 1.02, and also capture shocks while at Mach 20. It, it's pretty hard to scale those, right? Um, right all those settings even, you have to change, and yeah, yeah. And so, um, you know, we have some, we have a lot of experience with this, and we can give anyone who wants uh, more information. We can get some more information on what we've done in the past. Um, but there's sometimes some tuning with the adaptive mesh case. But you know, the transient models that allow, like the booster separation case, that's a very easy case to set up. Um, mm -hmm. The overset mesh is very simple. And we have a built-in model-driven AMR for overset that basically will refine the background mesh ahead of that motion. Um, so that's a very simple case, um, and, and lots of people do that. Wow. Yeah, that's that's really sweet. I, I loved seeing that animation. I mean, I haven't, haven't really got to look at too much stuff like that. Uh, so it's cool to hear you say that it, it's doable and it's done regularly, and that's it just seems like a, it seems like we're getting off into the future, which is really cool. Yep. Yep. Okay, um, we're getting to the top of the hour, but I have a few minutes yet. I think I can get to the, a couple of uh, additional questions here. There was a question from uh, Justin um, about, is this mesh being shown in advancing layer mesh or the normal prism layer mesh we used? Um, this particular one uses the normal prism layer mesh. Um, and uh, there's kind of, the, for those of you that are, aren't maybe star or people that may not mean anything, but there's two different kind of boundary layer or, or boundary fitted uh, meshing strategies. One's a prism layer mesher um, and one's the advancing layer mesher. Basically the difference is the prism layer mesher builds the outer kind of subsurface first, right? And figures out kind of, it's retracting these things and you know extending it out and then it comes back down from there. Whereas the advancing layer mesher goes layer by layer. It starts from the surface and builds layer by layer. 
This particular demo case, I used the prism layer mesher only because I wanted to be able to use the, this kind of stuff. As it gets to the back, it'll automatically kind of retract the layers. Um, right now, the advancing layer mesher, we're working on building the same kind of features that will kind of stop the advancing layers when it gets to a certain um, aspect ratio. Um, but that's not currently in the production. It's the it's, I think it's in the next releases. They're hoping to release that feature. Um, so this particular one, I use prism layer mesher. But um, for a lot of hypersonic cases, the advancing layer mesher makes really nice, high quality meshes. And a lot of times, we'd recommend using that. It just depends on what your preference is, which one you're kind of more used to doing, and how you how you're used to setting up your models. Yep. But but yeah, so there is retraction capability. That basically, like this this is done because when you have refined like the refinements around the fillet here, right? The mesh the the surface mesh here is much finer than it is here, and in order to to you know make sure that your prism layer meshes don't get really long and skinny, right? You have to retract the layer, right? And so that's why I have that set up. Here. But either one will work. We have the same case run with advancing layer mesher, and and if you you know properly set up the boundary layer to to the, encompass the bow shock, you get very similar results. And the last one was what kind uh, VK asked what kind of additional routines do you write and compile for these simulations? So this simulation has no additional um, uh, automation capability than what's built into what I showed. So uh, it's essentially the only like automation or routine that's built in around this one was that mock ramp that I have, right? So I showed this this mock number ramp, um, and this is taken care of with just a simple. This is just a simple piecewise function, um, right? Once that's set up, then everything else is taken care of, right? So that's that's where the CFL number here, the automatic CFL control, automatically ramps down. I don't have to tell it what to do. Um, I just set this one to to run to fifteen thousand iterations. I could I could have set a criterion based on you know the heat shield convergence or something like that as well. Um, but this one doesn't have any additional uh, cases. You can see that I have AMR criterion, right? These would these are ones I didn't show much, but right there's just kind of a simple function based on uh, what's available, right? I'm grading a Mach number, right? Um, and that that is something that was set up for the AMR case, right? And that allowed me to get um, oops, get to the right this one, right? That, then that's just defining when and how the AMR is doing. But again, that's all within the uh, GUI and within the sim file. So there's no additional automation run on this. Um, you can, there's there's extensive Java capabilities that that's the language that starts CCM Plus is GUI is written in. So you can do very, very complex automation um, implemented with a macro um, in that sense. There's also other inbuilt ways. I didn't do it, but there's inbuilt operations here that you can use to kind of um, solve one solution. So it, this would be a case where um, for some of those transient simulations, right, or not, not necessarily transient, but a if we have a transient uh, thermal problem, right? So we, we know that we're operating a hypersonic air breathing vehicle at, you know, four minutes at the same Mach number and altitude, but right over time, right, that, 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 body's going to heat up. Um, and so, you know, you have the same kind of steady state flow solution, but the thermal solution is on a different time scale. So in that case, we can use an inbuilt thing called a simulation operation where we can basically solve one condition, right? We can solve the physics going on in the, in the steady state case, right? And then we could map the solution, um, the temperature field, right, to a solid model and then solve that solid model, right, in a transient case, right? It'd be a different case we'd solve as a transient sim, right? And then go back and loop that. This can all be put in a loop, which I didn't do in the first place, right? But so all of this can be built in with the tools that we have. And I'll drag and drop like I can, right? You can just drag and drop those there. So this would be how you do something like that, right? We're looping it, we're solving the steady state case, we're mapping the data to, right, the, the transient, uh, Switch solid on. body model, right? We're solving that new transient for a certain amount of time, and then we'd go back and solve the physics to, to update the flow model if we needed to update the heat transfer coefficients or something. So there's a lot of different ways and tools that you can build things directly in the Star CCM Plus. We kind of try to make it so that you can do a lot of the automation without having to write additional scripts and compile anything. Any other questions? Um, my contact information was shown at the end here. I'll bring that back up. Okay. Um, feel free to email me with any questions you might have, um, and I'd be happy to, to uh, 
go into those further or talk more uh, in detail with you. And thanks again to um, all the folks at TIFA th that have been organizing it and moderating. So really appreciate you guys enabling us to come and talk here. And um, hope everyone learned a lot this week. I know uh, I did in the sessions I was able to, to sit in on. So yeah, thanks. Thanks, Jeremy, for bringing this. This uh, It's content like this that makes TFOS effective. Uh, so thank you for showing this software. It, it, I'm really impressed by it. Uh, and uh, really appreciate your time.